So I hope you know that all of our virtual community programs are available for on-demand viewing on our YouTube channel. They're accessed by going to our website and clicking on the YouTube icon in the upper right-hand corner. They're there so that you and your friends worldwide can enjoy these programs at your leisure. We do have costs for these programs, so any donation that you can make would be most appreciated. And donations to Morikos Audubon not only support our community programs, but as you heard, the field trip committee has been on fire, our numerous field trips. We've given over 120 field trips in the last year, a uh, little bit over a year. Um, we have education programs in local elementary schools. We have conservation activities. We maintain the Sweet Springs Nature Preserve. We provide scholarships for bird camps and interns at High Mountain Condor Lookout, among other things. And we can't do all this without you. So think about going to the site the website at the end and making a donation to Marco Audubon. You will note that everyone is muted and your videos are turned off. That's to avoid any distractions. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please write them in the chat, address them to me, and I am listed as Moro Coast Audubon Q&A. Don't address them to any of the other hosts because I won't see them. <laughs> and I'm gonna be the one asking the questions at the end. And we'll ask whatever questions you have at the end. So on to tonight's program. Linda Kropp is Chief Counsel at the Environmental Defense Center, the EDC, where she has worked as an attorney since 1989 and has served as Chief Counsel since 1999. Linda specializes in oil and energy issues, as well as cases that protect open space and natural resources. She was the lead counsel in, in the successful efforts to prevent development of the Hearst and Fiscalini ranches and to defeat Phillips' proposal to transport oil by rail to its Napomo refinery. In addition to working at the EDC, Linda teaches environmental law at UC Santa Barbara. Tonight, she's going to be addressing multiple aspects of the wind energy project off the coast of Morro Bay, as well as discussing the relationship between the wind energy development and the proposed, proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. So, Linda, it is with great pleasure that I give you the floor. We're looking forward to this. Thank you, Judy. And thank you to... Wendy and the other folks at Morro Coast Audubon, this is really a great treat. I wish I was there in person, um, but it's nice to have this opportunity to join you uh, virtually. Um, so I was telling some of the hosts um, as we were waiting to get started that um, the Central Coast is really dear to my heart. I lived up in Cambria for a while. I've worked on some of the cases that she mentioned. Um, I was actually just in Avila this weekend and kayaking and hiking. And so um, you live in a very special place and we're trying to keep it that way. Um, so I have a presentation I'm going to share. Okay, hopefully that's working. Um, so first, just to give you an introduction to the Environmental Defense Center. We don't Center. have that up. Pardon? We don't have the presentation. Try this one. There we go. How about now? Good to go. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so the Environmental Defense Center is a nonprofit public interest environmental law firm. We were founded in the 70s as a direct result of the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill, which really galvanized the nation, but you know, especially the community to the risks of offshore oil and gas development, but other types of you know, human activities as well that can have um, impacts on public health and the environment. And uh, we were formed as the, uh, a tool for the community, for other environmental groups, for community groups uh, from Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo counties to monitor, uh, serve as a watchdog for environmental issues, but also to bring some legal expertise. And that was a critical time because prior to 1969, we didn't have very many environmental protection laws. And the ones that we had were 
uh, much weaker than, than what we have now. They were focused more on uh, perhaps funding research or encouraging um, conservation. But when you know, everyone woke up after the 1969 oil spill, there was a slew of environmental laws that passed within a few years, um, starting with the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA, um, which required environmental review before federal agencies take actions or approve projects. Um, that's something we take for granted now. It did not exist prior to 69. Um, and then other environmental laws, such as the Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, as well as some state laws, um, signed by a Republican president and governor uh, with a lot of bipartisan support. I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, so EDC helped other organizations use these new tools to try to protect the environment and public health. And we do that um, through an assortment of strategies. We're different than other law firms in that because we're a nonprofit, we can do more than just litigate. We have the resources that we can provide education. We can provide advocacy. About half of our cases are uh, before governmental agencies trying to get them to take um, appropriate actions so we don't have to sue. And then finally, we have that legal hammer if necessary. And that um, is something that we've used over the years to protect open spaces and protect our coast from more offshore oil development and uh, protect a lot of wildlife, endangered, threatened species, et cetera. So um, to jump into wind, so a lot of our work, it's not. There we go. Um, so historically, we've done so much work dealing with offshore oil and gas. We have prevented more leasing. We've prevented specific projects. We've stopped marine tankering. Um, but that's really been you know, one of our special areas of expertise. But with you know, the continued focus on climate change, we realize it's not enough to stop fossil fuel development, but we need to really help promote the transition to clean energy. And so supporting conservation and efficiency, solar and wind. The real focus on offshore wind didn't start locally till about 2016. Um, however, nationally, the movement goes back much earlier. The uh, main law that deals with offshore oil and gas development was amended in 2005 by the passage of the Energy Policy Act, which gave the Department of Interior the authority to grant leases and rights of way and easements for offshore wind. So before that, wind was really focused onshore, but the Energy Policy Act of 2005 gave the Department of Interior authority to consider um, any approvals for offshore wind. And it's not the only law, you know, other laws still apply, you know, the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, the National Environmental Policy Act, et cetera. But this law was very important because it gave the agency the authority to consider projects at all by granting the leases and the rights of way. Excuse Linda, me, Linda? You Linda? Yes? Uh, yeah. You're not uh, slide showing. You need to turn the slideshow on. Okay, it says I'm slide. I'm uh, top left from beginning. Yeah. Not showing? Uh, no. We're seeing all your slides. There we go. Yep. How about now? There we go. Now we're good. Okay. Let me see if I can go down. Now, do you see the second slide? Yes, we're good now. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, you got a nice preview, I guess. <laughs> um, so there were some other aspects of the Energy Policy Act that are important. Um, it was not just about you know, setting the stage and promoting a new industry offshore, but at the same time, 
you know, ensuring protections for the environment and safety and national security and other ocean users. Um, so that was a, a balancing that was required by this law. Also, because what occurs in the federal jurisdiction offshore, which is more than three miles, affects the coastal states as well. So the Energy Policy Act also required consultation and coordination with coastal states. The states still retain jurisdiction over the first three miles offshore. So from the mean high tide line out three miles. So any infrastructure that's necessary to serve these offshore wind farms is still under the jurisdiction of the state. So that's why it's important to have that close coordination between the federal agencies and the state agencies. So um, you probably have heard about various offshore wind proposals on the East Coast, um, lots of battles, things moving pretty slowly. In 2022, uh, Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which was partly intended to give a boost to the wind industry by offering tax credits, uh, credits for investment, promoting jobs for just transmission, uh, just transition, uh, providing funding to plan for transmission from these new renewable energy projects, and providing agency staffing to help support and review any applications. One of the other Last minute changes in the Inflation Reduction Act, thanks to Senator Manchin, was a requirement to tie offshore wind development with continuing leasing for offshore oil. This was very controversial. So everyone was getting behind you know, the promotion and incentivization for wind in the Inflation Reduction Act. And the last minute to get his vote, um, the act had to be amended to require that um, the federal agency that's responsible for offshore wind leasing, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, it's the same agency that offers leases for offshore oil and gas development. Um, this amendment required BOEM to refrain from issuing any new lease for offshore wind unless the agency has offered at least 60 million acres for oil and gas leasing in the previous year. So basically holding offshore wind hostage to more oil and gas leasing as we're trying to transition off of fossil fuels. So that is why you see the Biden administration going forward with, um, in this particular case, it's really focused on the Gulf um, oil and gas leasing. It's really because unless he did that, we couldn't even get offshore wind. So that was something a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, there's also been some quite a lot of legislative action at the state level. The state has been, has been way ahead of the federal government in terms of looking at how to um, decrease our greenhouse gas emissions, increase our renewable energy targets. In 2018, SB 100 passed, which set uh, renewable energy targets for um, the state at 50% by 2025, 60% by 2030, and 100% by 2045. But we didn't have a path to get there. So in 2021, the legislature passed AB 525, specifically focused on offshore wind generation. Um, and because as the agencies were looking at how we were gonna meet the 100% renewable energy targets, they realized um, offshore wind was gonna to have to play a substantial piece. And this was a whole new ball game for California. So you know, we didn't know where it was gonna be, you know, how effective it would be, how much energy it would provide. So AB 525 initially had some specific aggressive targets for offshore wind, but as the legislature was considering the bill, they realized, you know, we don't even know enough to set targets. We need to study this. So the law directed the California Energy Commission to evaluate the capacity for wind offshore California and to come up with goals for 2030 and 2045. And then to identify where that wind energy 
might occur, realizing it would be in federal waters, but working with BOEM and other federal agencies to identify where the um, actual production might occur. And that evaluation was supposed to be done by June of last year. And Linda, that, Linda, are you aware that your 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 slides are not cycling? You're still on the wind. Yes. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. No. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. This is my background. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and so, as once the targets are set, then strategic planning goes into play, and and a whole process unfolds that I'll talk about. Um, so the California Energy Commission undertook this evaluation and came up with targets of um, three gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030, um, comprised mostly of looking at Morro Bay and Humboldt, 10 to 15 gigawatts by 2045 and 20 gigawatts by 2050. So the most immediate goal was three gigawatts by 2030. However, the governor did not like those numbers, thought they were too low. So the governor told CEC to raise the numbers. So they raised them to up to five gigawatts by 2030, 25 gigawatts by 2045, um, which is quite a substantial jump um, with no you know, analysis of is that feasible or, or where that would um, occur. But those are our current numbers. So up to five gigawatts by 2030, looking again at Morro Bay and Humboldt, 25 gigawatts by 2045. So CEC continues to um, advance the planning now. They're looking at you know, where to um, you know, look at potential growth, um, but also how we're gonna get this first phase um, off the ground. So the impetus behind all this is, of course, transitioning from fossil fuels to renewables, you know, benefits ranging anywhere from reducing impacts on the climate, providing some energy independence um, by creating more energy in California and offshore California. There are also benefits to ratepayers and employment. And with wind in particular, um, there are some reliability benefits because the wind energy complements solar. So you get solar energy during the day, you get the wind energy um, at night. So it's a nice complement to solar. So I wanna talk about the process for a little bit because I think it's really important for the public to know when we can engage. And it's a really interesting process, uh, very different from what I'm used to in terms of offshore oil and gas development. And the reason I think is because of the Energy Policy Act and this push both at the federal and state level to get things moving, some things have been a bit streamlined um, from what we're used to. So the beginning of the process starts with um, a request for information from the industry. So is there any interest from the industry? Um, and they call these, um, they're looking at what they call call areas. So tell us what areas you think um, you might be interested in developing from an industry perspective. Once they get the industry interest, then BOEM as the lead federal agency, but in consultation with other agencies in the states, identifies wind energy areas. So where are the areas that industry has some interest that also have the potential for decent production and also have um, the feasibility that's necessary to consider any wind development in that area. So those are called the wind energy areas. Um, BOEM will prepare an analysis. It's available for public review and comment. Um, we commented, folks up in your area commented as well, looking at things like you know, what other uses might be impacted, what the environmental impacts might be, what the you know, labor impacts might be. It's really looking at everything. Um, and then after receiving that comment, then BOEM decides whether or not to lease any areas to developers. Um, leases are required because we own the waters. The government holds them in trust for us, but um, we can't give 
offshore resources to private developers, they can receive a lease and that gives them access to develop those resources. So, so the next step is that BOEM considers what areas within the wind energy areas to actually offer for lease. And at this point is the first time environmental review happens. And that's an opportunity for the public to comment. And in this case, the um, environmental review was not an environmental impact statement, which is what we're used to seeing with offshore oil and gas. Instead, it was a much broader, shorter, um, little more superficial review called an environmental assessment. And the reason Bohm did that was because Bohm said, well, just issuing a lease doesn't really allow much. It's not until later that they actually get approvals to build anything. So we're just going to look at when we issue a lease, what we're really allowing is some initial surveys to be conducted, and they can be conducted in a way that has minimal environmental impact. Um, so they issued their environmental assessment, public commented on it. Uh, the Coastal Commission also had an opportunity to comment on the proposed lease areas and um, evaluate them and determine if um, leasing in those areas would be consistent with our state's um, coastal policies. So that, ha that has happened already, um, as you probably know. Um, there was, there were, after taking all that public comment, then the final environmental assessment was published, and then there was an auction um, that happened at the end of the year, and um, leases were issued both offshore Morro Bay and Humboldt. And so the next step where we are now is in that kind of pretty blue, teal blue area, uh, pre-survey meetings and planning to do some uh, what's called site assessment, um, site assessment planning. So a site assessment, what that means is the lessee can actually go out on the water now because they have the lease and they do a lot of surveys. They do surveys about the seafloor to see where they might want to install infrastructure. They do surveys about wildlife. Um, they do surveys about um, the actual uh, wind energy in the area. So this is all the kind of the data gathering phase. At the end of that, then they will decide what they actually want to build out there. And they'll submit what's called a construction and operations plan. And at that point, BOEM prepares a full environmental impact statement. And there's an opportunity for the public to comment and the Coastal Commission gets to weigh in again. And then when that's finalized, then they, you know, if they get their plan approved, then they do their final designing and installation. Um, and those plans have to also be approved, uh, but there's no more you know, public comment or environmental review. And then finally they install. So this whole thing takes many years. Um, we're already a couple years in and the planning process actually began in 2016, but you know, more focused on Morro Bay in the last few years. And then the site assessment and surveys can take anywhere from two to five years. And then, you know, a couple more years to do the final um, approvals of the construction and operations plan. And then finally the installation. So, you know, we're still a ways out from actually seeing anything being built. But I do wanna comment again on you know, the fact that this is different than what we see with offshore oil and gas leasing. With offshore oil and gas leasing, from the very, very beginning of the process, before any areas are considered for leasing, there's a full environmental impact statement that looks at you know, what the energy production goals are, are there appropriate areas to produce, what those impacts might be, not just from the initial surveys, but all the way through to development. Um, because the whole purpose of issuing a lease is to allow development. And so there's an environmental impact statement prepared way up front. Um, and that's really important because that's when you look at all the impacts at once early on. And that's when you can look then at, are there you know, alternatives? Are there different types of energies you know, besides offshore oil and wind or you know, different locations? And you you know, the best way to really have the flexibility for good decision making and 
considering the public input is if you do that at the very beginning. And Bohm used to do that with offshore wind, like with the Cape Wind project on the East Coast, they did prepare an environmental impact statement before they issued any leases, but they don't do that anymore, um, which is really interesting. I think it's part of the effort to get things moving more quickly. So in California, um, there was a call um, put out um, in 2018. And interestingly enough, <laughs> it was harder than Bohm thought to find areas to, you know, put out there to industry to um, explore any interest because the Department of Defense didn't want wind anywhere offshore California. They were concerned about interference with their you know, exercises, with their radar, with you know, all sorts of different issues. And so actually after all this you know, legislative incentivizing and getting this you know, task forces, getting the state and the federal government working together, DOD, DOD objected to every area that um, Bohm wanted to issue a call for. So um, finally, DOD was you know, told like, will you tell us <laughs> you know, where, where could we offer some um, leases? And so they identified three areas, Humboldt up north and then Morro Bay and Diablo Canyon um, on the central coast. And you can see on this slide um, next to the Morro Bay call area, um, there's uh, just to the east of that is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So right next door. So Diablo Canyon was eliminated um, through those early stages of planning. And so came down to Humboldt and Morro Bay. And so then they started looking like looking at whether or not they could expand the Morro Bay area. Um, and they proposed expansions to the east and the west. There was a lot of consternation about expansion to the east for two reasons. Uh, one was because we now have this area proposed for the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. And the expansion area was going to cut into that proposed sanctuary. But also, you know, from a wildlife perspective, um, the studies that have been prepared so far indicate the further offshore, the, the, you know, the less um, the impact is on wildlife. If you're talking about migrating whales or seabirds, um, bats, sea turtles, et cetera. And if you can at least be you know, 20 miles or so offshore um, for this area, that's better. And so that Eastern extension area was taken off the map as well. Um, so there's no direct overlap with the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. Um, however, you have to get that energy to shore. And so cables would be used to bring the energy from the wind turbines to shore. And so as you can see from this uh, map that the cables would have to run through the sanctuary. And so BOEM and um, the sanctuary program and NOAA are all trying to figure out you know, how, how that would work. The impacts of offshore wind um, on the West Coast are quite different than on the East Coast. Some of the impacts are obviously the same, like when you think about birds and um, things like that. But we have a very deep shelf um, off of the Pacific Coast. And so it's too deep to have anchored wind turbines. So they have what they use is called floating wind. And this is a technology that's starting to be used a couple places overseas, but it's still a very nascent technology. And so you have these floating turbines, and these are massive. Um, the blades can be, you know, 100 to 300 feet um, long. And then they would be cabled to the seafloor and there would be, that's where the anchoring would occur. And then there would be some, they would be connected. So there would be some substations and other infrastructure on the seafloor 
And then there would also be cables to shore. So in terms of what the environmental concerns are, um, there are numerous. Um, you know, we talked about the benefits, but there's also impacts. And so um, there's impacts, you know, collisions for wildlife, both you know, below the water surface as well as above, um, entanglements because of those networks of cables, noise from construction primarily, but some for operation, displacement, and that there's a very large area, the Morro Bay wind energy area is almost 400 square miles. So displacing definitely other, you know, users, but also, you know, potentially um, displacing wildlife um, from the area as well. Um, ship strikes because of the vessels that would be going from shore out to the farm for um, maintenance, um, habitat impacts on the seafloor, and then um, there'll be impacts from running the cables to shore, but then also the onshore development. There has to be infrastructure onshore um, to, first of all, we don't really know where these turbines are gonna be manufactured, but they're very difficult to transport. So there's a possibility you have to manufacture them nearby. So that's quite an industry, um, whether, or not that happens, you have a lot of other inshore, onshore infrastructure like the ports that you know, help service the turbines. Um, you've got the vessels, you've got the um, transmission onshore. So there's quite a bit of onshore development and infrastructure that's required as well. In terms of views, which is another concern, um, because this particular area is so far offshore. Um, you could, you, if you look closely on this photograph, this simulation, you can see them. Um, you know, if it's a foggy day, probably not. Um, but they are, they're pretty far offshore. You know, they're further offshore than, say, any of the oil platforms are in our region. But yeah, they'll still be visible some of the time. So in terms of next steps, um, from the permitting standpoint, uh, we are at that point in the timeline where the lessees, there's three lessees off, um, in the Morro Bay area, they are starting to put together their survey plans and then those will have to be approved and then they can actually get out um, and spend a couple of years um, doing their site assessments. Um, at the same time, the state agencies that are involved are really focusing a lot on the transmission side of things. Um, so for offshore Morro Bay, there is some transmission capacity. That's one reason why that there was some industry interest there because of the old Duke Energy plant um, and you know, eventually Diablo Canyon. So the California Energy Commission is working with the Public Utilities Commission and then a state entity called CAISO that really focuses on statewide transmission of electricity. And they're looking at the planning to accommodate these various um, targets that have been set now by the CEC and looking at infrastructure, um, the state as well as local agencies are looking at where the ports might be that will service these projects and planning for that. Um, there's a couple studies that have just come out recently about um, possible ports that could be used, looking at, you know, could we use an existing port? Do we have to look at building new ports? Um, and then um, under AB 525, the California Energy Commission. Um, it still has some functions it has to complete. It has to finish its strategic plan. It has to um, still work with the federal agencies to look at additional sea space in federal waters to meet those newer, higher targets. Um, and so you can see a lot of activity is happening at the California Energy Commission. And if you're interested in this, I highly recommend 
that you sign up on their email list. Um, they're having a series of workshops. They've got one coming up on the 23rd um, next week about seaports and workforce issues. Um, but all of these issues that come into their planning and their strategic plan, they're gonna do a series of workshops. So these are open to the public. You can watch online, you can go in person, you can testify, you can write written comments. Um, so I definitely would say, um, you know, sign up with the California Energy Commission. And as we are implementing AB 525, because there are so, much, so many gaps in information, um, even aside what the California Energy Commission has on its plate, that there are uh, three main bills I'm aware of this year. Folks can chime in during the Q&A if you know of others. Um, AB3 is focused on looking at the seaport issue um, and um, looking at both alternatives for retrofitting existing ports, um, but also potentially looking at new ports. AB80, um, the principal author is Don Addis from your area, I believe. Um, this bill would establish a science entity which would um, help fill data gaps regarding baseline, collecting baseline information and monitoring and um, identifying as we evolve through this process, identifying new areas of research and also working on data standardization because you've got different agencies collecting information, you've got a lot going on on the NGO side, you've got a lot going on on academia, so um, this science entity would also help standardize and share information. And then SB 286, um, authored by McGuire up north, um, focuses on the state side permitting. So I mentioned the anything that has to run through state waters and on the coast. So this bill um, clarifies the process, identifies the California State Lands Commission, as the lead agency for environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, that makes sense because just like leases are required in federal waters to run cables through state waters requires a lease as well. And the State Lands Commission has to issue those leases. So the State Lands Commission will be the lead agency for environmental review and work with other agencies to make sure that review is complete. Um, the other thing that's a little bit more controversial is um, the law would require the Coastal Commission to issue any coastal development permits. So the way the Coastal Act works right now is for the any development onshore, which is gonna be part of you know, these projects, right now it's the local city or county that considers any permits for that onshore infrastructure. And if it's in the coastal zone, that may be appealed up to the California Coastal Commission. And under existing law, if there's a project like this that involves offshore permitting and coastal permitting, then the applicant, in this case, the wind developer and the local agency, which would be the city or the county and the coastal commission can all agree that the coastal commission will issue one consolidated permit with input from the local government, um, but they don't have to. Um, if the local government still wants to have its own say, you know, prior to the potential for an appeal, it can do that and hold its own process and consider, um, you know, input from the public. So under SB 286, um, part of the streamlining is to say, well, you know, this is probably going to end up at the Coastal Commission anyway. So we're just going to have the Coastal Commission issue a consolidated permit for all wind projects. It's going to mandate it. And I'm not sure how cities and counties feel about it. Um, I, you know, I, from the NGO side, I've heard kind of mixed reactions. Some people feel that because the Coastal Act, and you know, is such a strong law um, that permits required under the Coastal Act, you know, we'll get the, you know, the type of protection for the environment that we need. Um, you know, and some are staying kind of neutral on the issue right now, still thinking about it. The third piece of SB 286 is to set up a fisheries working group to try to work with the fishing um, industry to 
um, you know, look at mitigation and um, you know, what other needs that they may have um, in the face of this new offshore wind development. So all three of these laws of our bills have passed their first policy committees and um, the next step uh, by the end of this week, I believe they would have to pass out of the um, appropriations committee. And then if they do, they would go to the floor. So two of the bills would go to the assembly floor, one would go to the Senate floor, and then they make it past that, then they go to the other chamber and go through the same process again. So, um, you know, in terms of getting involved, um, I mentioned I you know, highly recommend signing up for the California Energy Commission email list and workshops. Um, you can also monitor what's happening at the federal level, although we're in a little bit of a, a lull right now. Um, you can join the Environmental Defense Center. Uh, we do send um, you know, emails and action alerts when there are any hearings or comment opportunities. Um, not every single one, but we, you know, the main ones we will. Um, and so that way you would learn about issues and hearings and opportunities for public comment. Um, and then you can also learn about other issues that we're working on. And I wanted to put a plug in our annual event is June 11th in Goleta. And so you're all invited to come to that as well. And here's my contact information. Yeah. Linda, thank you so much. This has been a great presentation. Um, there's <laughs> a lot going on and it's very technical, I think is what I at least <laughs> am feeling. Um, I, if anyone has questions, um, Please put them in the chat directed to Moro Coast Audubon Society. I'm seeing a couple of them there. So I'm going to start out with some of those questions, Linda, if that's okay. Um, how are the impacts to humans, like local residents, business owners, vacationers, um, due to physical changes needed for the implementation? How are those impacts to us being evaluated? And she says, you know, it's not your grandmother's Moro Bay anymore. <laughs> I know. Um, I think the biggest change will be what happens with the onshore infrastructure. Um, I think the biggest change is going to be you know, what port is used. You know, if they use port. I know Port of Long Beach is very interested. They want to, you know, build this massive, like, four hundred acre area to manufacture and then you know do off you know sea transport um that then of course wouldn't have as much impact on Morro bay but i think you know at this point everything's on the table and so i mean if there was to be a like a massive port in the Morro bay area that would be a huge change um i i know the fishing community locally has some you know issues and concerns um I think that um, you know, I, I don't I don't think the area would be as impacted by the transmission because there is some infrastructure already. Um, but I would say definitely, you know, once we get to the point where there's some you know actual projects proposed and there's some environmental review, um, that's when the California State Lands Commission will look at you know, everything, you know, off what's happening offshore, but also what's happening onshore. And there'll be, you know, workshops and hearings. State Lands Commission is a very transparent agency. I've worked with them a lot and I'm sure they'll hold local town halls and, and meetings okay. and, and such. Um, I did want to comment on, um, yeah, this seems all very big and kind of overwhelming. What, what I think is most, what I like to tell people is, Number one, you don't have to be an expert. <laughs> Aud I mean, Audubon has plenty of experts. And if you are an expert on anything, that's fantastic. Um, we work with Audubon all the time, even though we aren't representing Audubon. We work with Gary George and you know, other Audubon experts. That's who we rely on. You know, we do joint comment letters. Um, so, you know, 
if there's one bird you care about, <laughs> um, focus on that because we don't need everybody to talk about everything. We need to know about all the little issues. I mean, not little issues. We need to know about all the potential impacts. Pick one and, you know, maybe you have a passion for that. Maybe, you know, you've read a paper about it. Um, maybe you know who to talk to at Cal Poly. Um, yeah, it's a collective effort, you know, so don't, don't be overwhelmed every, you know, and if you just have personal feelings, um, that's important too. Right. I know some of the conversations that more Coast Audubon has had with Gary George, for instance, have been on the issue of, of adaptive management and monitoring and how do you monitor seabird strikes? On shore, you go around in the morning and you look for dead birds on the ground. Well, that doesn't work in a in a marine environment. So what will be the process for that? So I know there's there's people across the country and across the world who are working on those very issues. And we're feeling really fortunate to have Gary's expertise who is tied into all of these other researchers on how do we minimize bird strike. Um, and that's the key to try, you know, what all the NGOs are saying in all of our comments to any agency is because of what you're talking about um, is, you know, first we want to have avoidance of impacts. And, you know, part of that is, you know, putting the turbines as far offshore as possible. But, you know, our first goal is avoid impacts where possible, then minimize. And there's things like, you know, how they design the blades and such. And then it's the monitoring and, and being able to do some adaptive management. Um, right. So it's definitely a, a tiering that we want to keep harping away at. Right. So there's another question. Will the federal uh, environmental impact statement be prepared as a joint NEPA CEQA document for the State Lands Commission and Coastal Commission for their permitting? We don't know that yet. Um, I don't know because I don't know how the timing that normally that would happen. Um, I'm just not sure how the timing is going to work because of the needs for this new infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So you can't wait till the last minute to decide where you're going to put a port <laughs> and then go through designing and environmental review. So um, I think we don't know that answer yet. It, I, there might be separate environmental reviews for some of these separate components. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's another question. How to prevent Mora Bay Estuary and Harbor from being a port, which would turn us into an industrial area? That is critical. <laughs> so definitely as part of any environmental review, alternatives have to be looked at. And you know, if there's a feasible alternative that would have you know, no or fewer impacts, um, that has to be what is selected. And the California Environmental Quality Act is very strong on that. Um, but we, I, I, I think we should not wait for that environmental review. As I mentioned, there are studies being done right now on ports. Um, there's at least three studies I know of already on ports. So I think, um, yeah, if anyone's interested, I can, you know, provide that information or I can give it to yeah, you know, Judy or Wendy or someone. Um, but I think starting to monitor that issue now um, is really important. I would agree. I mean, Mora Bay has some natural problems with it, but the the little port of Mora Bay itself, but that doesn't mean that someplace up farther the coast, um, I've seen the possibility of up around Hayukas <laughs> being a port. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's something that we need to monitor and we will be, we have your contact information. And if people write questions to Moore Coast Audubon, we will forward those, that information down to you or give them your information so they can contact you directly. So another question, is offshore wind even needed? Mark Jacobson, a Stanford engineering professor, wrote no miracles needed that existing technologies can adequately supply renewable energy. I'm familiar with Mark. I respect him. I have not read 
yeah, anything he has said about offshore wind. From everything I have read, offshore wind is a key component. And it's um, partly just to get the numbers high enough, but it's also, again, that complement to solar. Um, so I haven't really heard anyone say we don't need it. I think it's a question of how much and where and, um, you know, personally, I am concerned about the higher numbers um, that the CEC put out last year um, after pressure from the governor, because I just don't know what they're, you know, they're not really based on on anything. They're certainly not based on any environmental considerations. So um, I think, you know, nothing's going to happen without going through that process I mentioned. So they'll have to identify a call area, then they'll have to identify, you know, where within that makes sense and, and the leasing. And we also have the Department of Defense out there still. Um, so I, I think it is needed. I just don't know on what's, if the scale is quite as much as what the current targets are. Yeah. So we have another question. The wind turbines are enormous in height and width. We know the size of the oil platforms offshore Goleta. The wind turbines are way bigger. Do you have a slide showing the a big platform, massive size turbine. And uh, she, this person also, Kathy Ann, wants to thank you for your very articulate presentation. <laughs> thank you. Um, I The only simulation I have is that one I already showed. So um, the platform off of UCSB is about two miles offshore. These will be, you know, 20 plus miles offshore. So that makes somewhat of a difference. Um, but from that simulation, I don't know how well you can see um, on a computer, but they're visible. They're they're not super visible, but they are a little bit visible. Um, but definitely the further offshore, the less visible they'll be. So are you aware of, of the uh, project that has been proposed off Vandenberg, which I that both national and more coast have been, and everyone else I've talked to has been adamantly opposed to. And I don't know if we have any power over that one. What can you say about that? You know, I had a slide about that and I thought, well, you know, this is Morro Bay. I'm going to talk about Morro Bay. <laughs> yes, I'm very happy to talk about Vandenberg. So as I mentioned, this whole West Coast planning process started in 2016 launched by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management at the federal level and bringing in the state agencies and other federal agencies. And there's, you know, we're part of this task force. It involves stakeholders and the public and, um, and everyone agreed we need planning, 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 planning. Um, and then in the middle of that, these two companies proposed, actually submitted applications for projects in state water. So, you know, not going through that federal process I, I walked um, us through. So they just submitted applications. Like, we're going to put these projects, state waters, offshore Vandenberg. And I think the reason they picked that location, besides the fact that there's wind there, is because it's off the military base. So they didn't have to worry about people complaining about the views. But that is, I'm speaking to the, the knowledgeable crowd here, it's one of the most ecologically sensitive places on the planet. Um, being in the transition zone of the you know, warmer and cooler Pacific waters and the level of biodiversity. And um, I mean, talk about migrating birds and whales. It is just a hot spot. So the absolute, you know, one of the absolute worst places you could put industrial development. So yes, we do have a say. Um, so the, the, these are going through the state process. And so the first step is they need a state lease. From the state lands commission so the state lands commission is uh processing the applications um one company has already dropped out so we're down to one um the state just hired the consultant that's going to prepare the environmental impact report so definitely you, know, you can sign up to get on that notice list as well but um yeah i think i mean i know you know, our position right now is, you know, that we do not want 
any wind development there. And I know there's a lot of opposition. We actually tried to get the State Lands Commission to not even um, consider the application because as the quote yeah. landholder, um, State Lands Commission is different than other agencies. They don't have to review and consider every application for a lease. They can say, we own those waters. We don't want industrial development there. Sorry, you know, lease is a contract. You need two parties to agree. So we actually tried to get them to um, not even consider the applications, but I think their lawyers told them that that was, they, they should probably at least consider the applications and go through the process. So um, I would say the environmental review process will probably start in a few months. Okay, thank you. Thanks for asking about that. <laughs> I know I know Audubon's going to be involved. <laughs> they will be involved. We will be involved. Um, can you talk a little bit about battery storage? Does that have anything to do with the with this? I mean, I know wind balances at solar because it blows at a time when the sun's not up, and so it can even add to the production. We have a power, we have a battery storage proposal in Morro Bay, but I think it's separate from the offshore wind. And if it, you don't feel like it's appropriate for tonight, I have a eight more, nine more questions for you after this one, so. I will say I'm not an expert on battery storage. I think it's part of any energy mix though, um, whether you're talking wind or solar or whatever, I think it's still going to be part of it, um, but I'm not an expert on that. Okay. So I, I don't know, like, I'm not saying like, do it in more of a, I'm just saying that I think just in terms of looking at the state, there was a, a piece right. there that it might be a, it might be a, a topic for another evening. Yeah. Um, so no, I'm watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll invite you. Um, mm -hmm. What about costs? Secretary Granholm has set a goal of reducing OSW costs by seventy percent, but isn't this energy going to be expensive? I know that's part of what the Inflation Reduction Act was looking at was trying, you know, through the tax credits um, for investment and development was trying to, you know, get at the cost issue. Um, I think that's going to be a continuing um, effort. I think we're going to see you know, more legislation on that as well. So, um, and I mean, eventually you'll have some economies of scale, but um, I don't, I do believe when you compare it to um, like fossil fuel, it's, I don't think it's going to be, don't quote me on this, but I don't think it's going to be any more you know, expensive um, on the consumer end, but I, I'm, again, I'm not an expert on that either. Uh, the blades are always shown as white. Is there any study that looks at the various other colors that might be seen more better by birds? Yes, there are studies being done on that. And you probably have folks in Audubon that would know more than me, but I have heard that um, even just painting one blade black helps a lot. Yeah. I just heard that recently. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things, you know, we're talking about how do you avoid or minimize impacts. I think the design is gonna be very important. Right. Um, who studied preferred offshore distance for wind and uh, in wind infrastructure and decided that 20 miles is better for sea animals. Do you have a, a source for that citation? I can definitely, um, I can definitely get that. Um, and it's not just a blanket 20 miles. It really depends on the area. Um, you know, it depends on you know, what the wildlife patterns are and, and things like that. So um, I will um, look for that and Try to make that available as well, but it it it's there have been a I mean there have been a lot of studies on these areas. We still need more, um, but I will um, try to forward some information on that. Okay, so so Kathy Ann, that was your question. If you send us an email so that we remember who asked that question, uh, we'll forward that information on to you. Um, another message from someone saying, excellent overview and explanation, and thank you for helping the public grapple with these huge projects, because they do seem huge from our point of view. <laughs> um, someone else wants to know how to get access to the studies about possible port locations, and who do we start, who do we contact um, starting now? 
So I can definitely send, I believe there's three already. Um, I can send those to you know whoever among our hosts here. Um, they can be forwarded. Um, and then there's, um, so AB3 is going to really focus some more attention on the ports in terms of studying and planning. Um, and Assembly Member Hart from the Santa Barbara County area is one of the um, co-authors on that. Um, the main author is, I don't know how to pronounce the person's name, Z-B-U-R, Jur, I think. Um, but there'll be a lot more coming out after, I'm, I'm assuming that bill is going to pass this year. And I think that'll provide you know more of a state-focused framework for these court studies. But they're already doing some studies. So I can forward that information. Okay, that would be great. So I think, I think there Dennis, is a, you again should send more cost an email that you're interested in that and we will forward that information on to you. I think there I think there's a general preference for you trying to use existing ports. Yeah, which makes sense. Right. Right. Well, I think that's it on the questions. Linda, thank you so much. This has been a great presentation. I've learned a lot. I was horrified, actually, at the, I mean, I knew there was a trade-off in the bill that was passed in order to get funding for offshore wind. I hadn't realized exactly what it said. So that was uh, a little bit of a shock to me and I suspect to a number of our other members. So, Well, and it's a catch-22 within the Inflation yeah. Reduction Act. You know, there's folks that are fighting that new lease sale in the Gulf right. for valid reasons. Right. And if that lease sale doesn't go through or that, yeah, this is a, still considered a sale, um, then it may hold up offshore wind. Right. Yeah. Right. Vote, right. vote, vote, vote. Don't I want to vote. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and encourage everyone else to vote. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here this evening.